And I'm going to um, pass this over to my colleague, Ginny McDonald. I also am a board member of EADB. I'm um, director of human resources for Webster Five. We can't hear you very well. We can't hear you. Okay, is that better? Yes. My name is Ginny McDonald, and I also am a board member of EADB. How many have been to EADB events in the past? Great, that's a good number, but I'm really thrilled to see so many new faces today. I hope you enjoy the presentation. For those of you who are not familiar with the EADB, Employers Against Domestic Violence is a nonprofit organization uh, run entirely by volunteers. And its mission is to connect employers with services and providers that can help them deal with the effects of domestic violence in the workplace. EADV was founded um, several years ago, and it was actually, it came out of the law firm of Mince Levin, and one of the people who worked on uh, developing EADV is going to welcome us because she's our host today. Uh, Naji Bal is the Commissioner of Revenue for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and she was with Mince Levin for 17 years, part of their domestic violence practice, and as I said, she was instrumental in actually starting this organization. So I'm going to hand the microphone to Nachi and let her walk in. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Did you get the lunch? Ready for the, for the program. Um, it's, it's an absolute pleasure for me to welcome you here today. Um, as Jenny mentioned, it's it's a little uh, it's, it's a little strange for me. I started at Mintz Levin back in 1989 as a first year lawyer, and as a first year attorney, uh, a colleague and I started the Mintz Levin Domestic Violence Project, which re provides representation uh, to women, mostly women, uh, to people who are to, to obtain temporary restraining orders, um, and also does lobbying work at the federal and the state level. Ms. Levin really took on the issue of DV um, and made it a, a firm-wide priority. Um, and one of the things that came out of that effort was this organization, the ADV. So it's a personal just thrill and honor for me to be here, to welcome you, to see so many people here. Um, I was re recalling a story with some folks outside in the hallway uh, before we got started. That my colleague uh, that started this project with me, uh, we were both uh, first year attorneys and therefore had the advantage of being young and not knowing what limits were. Uh, don't underestimate the, the value of that ever in your life. Um, so my friend who, uh, who started this project with me was, like myself, an attorney, a very accomplished woman, uh, very um, well educated. We were both first year lawyers at one of the premier law firms in Boston. and. She had a DV issue in her, in her life and someone that she was trying to stay away from um, and keep herself uh, sort of hidden from in a way. Um, and so she went to the HR department, which was wonderful at the firm, and to meet with them and to provide a picture of her um, uh, person, her abuser that she was trying to uh, avoid. And you know, to have that be at the receptionist desk and have people know his name so that if he tried to contact her, et cetera. And you know, this was in the day, this was 1989, so we didn't, for, didn't yet have a website, you know, which would have presented a whole bunch of other issues in terms of locating people. But the, the firm, as good as it was, didn't have a structure to deal with her request. Uh, and to their credit, sort of took it on as, as um, something that needed to be put in place. And I think that's really the impulse behind this organization, is understanding what needs to be put in place to support your employees, um, and, to, and to ensure a safe workplace, not only for employees who might be dealing with the issue of domestic violence, but those who work around them. So I, I'm just thrilled and honored uh, that you folks are here. I'm looking forward immensely to your presentation. And thank you all for coming, and thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks so much, Commissioner. So uh, I'm going to introduce Lundy now and somebody that uh, most of you are very familiar with. But uh, I'm going to read his background, since it's not possible to memorize all the amazing things that Lundy's done. He has over 20 years of experience specializing in interventions for abusive men, as many of you know from his work at Emerge. 
Um, he's the author of three books in the field, including Why Does He Do That, When Dad Hurts Mom, and uh, Batterer's Parent, a National Prize winner. And he also has a new book coming out this spring. Um, and you can also find a, a chapter based on his um, writing and work in a, a book by the Civic Institute um, on domestic abuse and child custody that was put out just a few months ago. Um, he's worked with over a thousand abusers directly as an intervention counselor and served as a clinical supervisor in another thousand cases. He's also served extensively as a custody evaluator, child abuse investigator, and an expert witness in domestic violence and child abuse cases. He appears across the United States as a presenter for judges and other court personnel, child protective workers, therapists, law enforcement officials, and other audiences. And his current training and writing focus on the impact on children of exposure to men who batter and how professionals can best support uh, children's recovery. And uh, now I'll give you Lundy. Thank you very much, and, I, and I, I, although I live in Massachusetts, I get very few opportunities to speak in this state, so it's delightful to actually get to have a, a Massachusetts audience, and, and we were really honored by the number of people who took an interest in today's program and, and signed up for it and showed up, so thanks a lot for being here. The, as you've already heard from what Sarah has said, I, I came into domestic violence from the offender end and spent years and years and years with my life deeply steeped in dealing with abusers, and I only had to be with them two hours a week. I mean, any particular guy, I only had to be with two hours a week. And so I would find myself often thinking, well, I'm going out of my mind after two hours around this guy. What would it be like to have to live with him under the same roof? And one of the themes that, that kept going through my mind over the, over the years that I was working with abusers and, and has really driven my, my writing and training work about it is confusion. And when I thought about today, I found myself coming back over and over again to this theme of confusion. That abusers are very, very good at creating all ki kinds of confusion, at making things seem so different from what they are, often at making things seem the opposite of what they are, uh, throwing up all kinds of smoke screens, making people spend a lot of time examining themselves to try to figure out what's wrong with them, uh, making people spend a lot of time examining each other to figure out what's wrong with other people, anything other than look carefully at the abuser. And communities end up contributing a lot to the confusion. In other words, the abuser ends up finding a lot of support from many different places in his community, and people who are able to back him up. And it's not just like bad people. There are a lot of really good people. There are a lot of really well-intentioned people. There are people who are really trying to do the right thing, who end up backing the abuser up in all kinds of ways, because of the, the ways that the mythology and misconception about abusers have gotten so widespread in our society in, in really in all modern societies, that almost everybody is to some extent subject to. And then the media, unfortunately, play a, a more problematic role than a helpful one. There are occasional pieces of good information. And, and actually, today, we will look at some examples of good information. We're not only going to look at bad information. <coughs> and, and so that we can think some about not just how to criticize or protest the bad influence of the media, but also so, how we, so that we can think about how to support and encourage <coughs> the people in media who are doing good work, who are doing positive education for the community. But the, but for the community. But the, the media is a really significant part of the problem. And you may not be convinced of that now. You may already be convinced of that. I think if you're not yet, you will be by the time you leave to be <coughs> convinced that the, that the media is in many, many ways really in the way. And what kind of response a particular woman or a particular abuser gets at the workplace is, is going to depend to a great extent on what people in the workplace have come to believe in an underlying sense about domestic violence, about violence and intimate relationships. 
to the extent that people have come to believe the key myths and misconceptions about abuse, that woman is not likely to get the kind of support that she really needs. And the abuser is likely to be able to wrap people around his finger and get away with a lot. Whereas, trying to move through an atmosphere where people really get the dynamics of domestic violence, really get how an abuser works, really get what an abused woman goes through and what her needs are, she starts to find herself in an atmosphere where she can really count on people to back her up and where she starts to feel stronger. And the abuser finds himself for the first time hitting walls. Now, my experience as an abuse counselor is that by the time the abuser gets into an abuser program, he has so many years, often decades, of finding that he can get past everybody that there's no situation that he can't find a way to work for to his advantage. There's nothing that he can't find a way to explain. Uh, there's nothing that he can't actually flip so that it becomes something to criticize the abused woman about. And we'll, we, we will look at specific examples from media that illustrate the whole process by which the victim is suddenly the one whose behavior is being examined or even the one who ends up apologizing for the crime of being abused, or for, for the crime of having been beaten. Now, I have often had people say to me over the years, wow, that, that's really something that you could work with abusers for all those years. I, I just really don't think I could do that. And they find it something kind of admirable. And I say, well, why? Why, why don't you think? Well, what do you think is so hard about it? Or, or, or why do you think you couldn't do it? And, and they say, well, because uh, I just don't think I could have any sympathy or compassion for the, for the abuser. Well, to me, that's already the beginning point of the confusion that abusers have created. Because they've created the notion that they are owed sympathy and compassion. Why? <laughs> I, uh, they're not owed a, a drop of special sympathy and compassion for the fact that they beat women. Since when is that a category for which you get special sympathy and compassion? Now, if a client, during the years that I worked with abusers, if a client came into the group with a broken leg, I had sympathy and compassion for him about his broken leg. If he came in with a terrible cold, I had sympathy and compassion for him about his cold. But I never had sympathy and compassion for him about being a woman abuser. So that already becomes the, 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 one of the first places where we start to get hooked in, where we start to feel like we have to understand this guy. We have to understand what he's going through. We have to figure out how to help him. And yet, for most other categories of really destructive behavior, where people are really harming other people, we don't immediately start to get drawn into, oh, well, gee, oh, this, you know. Our focus tends to be on the people that they're harming. And our focus tends to be on how can we make this person stop and how can we impose some kind of consequences that might make them not want to do it again. And yes, we also believe in offering services. I'm actually a, obviously a believer in offering services or I wouldn't have done all those years of work with abusers. But, but I spent those years with abusers demanding that they change. And I spent those years with abusers talking to them over and over again from a really outraged place what I felt about what they had done and, and the kind of damage they were bringing to so, the lives of so many women and the lives of so many children and the kind of damage they're doing to the lives of communities because abusers are having these vast effects on all kinds of things about our quality of life. 